we're the first firm dedicated solely to animal protection law. Uh, we advise on cases across various UK jurisdictions, but also abroad. Um, animal law is, is not a distinct body of law in the way that something like criminal law is. It's an incredibly wide uh, ranging area of law that touches on things from public law to criminal law to even stuff like advertising standards that I will, I, I will cover a bit in some depth um, later. The firm was set up by two uh, expert animal uh, law solicitors, David Thomas and Edie Bowles. Um, I've been really lucky to spend the last few months working alongside them as a paralegal while I finished my bar professional training course exams. Um, I'm going to be starting pupillage in October. That's sort of the last uh, stage of training as a barrister in England with a view to becoming a criminal law and regulatory barrister. Uh, the reason it's me who's giving you this talk today is because I recently assisted with the legal research on a case where we are advising Scottish Salmon Watch, uh, one of our clients. Now, a client has kindly said that we can uh, talk about a bit of the work that we've done with them um, and uh, on the rather sort of patchy, uh, wide ranging regulations around salmon law. And I think. The advantage for the non-lawyer here is that by focusing on a particular client or a particular case, it, it allows, um, allows me to bring kind of to life a bit more what could otherwise be a very dry and somewhat impenetrable talk. Uh, so uh, just a, a few words about the client. Um, our client's Don Staniford of uh, um, Scottish Salmon Watch. He makes no secret of the fact that he's not the most popular man in the industry. Uh, New Zealand's Herald referred to him as the fish farm bogeyman. He's also been called a hare in the soup of the global fat salmon farming industry. He came to us with some pretty wide ranging questions uh, about the legality of the regulatory framework itself uh, and also trickling down into particular um, practices and, and um, treatments uh, pertaining to salmon on salmon farms. But before we get into any real detail on, on the case or the law, I think it might just be important to touch a bit on, on some background stuff because for people who aren't familiar with salmon farming, um, it's very much its, its own unique beast uh, as, as farming goes. So there's a few things that probably bear repeating for the uninitiated. Uh, the salmon. Um, you may, if you watched nature documentaries and such growing up, uh, recognize the king of the fish from those incredible scenes of sort of jumping uh, up rapids and, and swimming thousands of miles up, up streams and rivers. The reason they do this is because they're, they're migratory fish who lay their eggs in um, freshwater and then spend most of their adult life feeding out at sea. Unfortunately, most wild salmon populations are in fast decline and that's for a whole variety of reasons, um, so climate change, human alteration to riverine habitats, commercial fishing both in fresh and salt water. The result of this is that whilst in between 1950 and 1990, uh, the global catch of wild salmon plummeted from 10,000 tonnes a year to 2,000 tonnes a year in 2005. Uh, and the response to this has been the um, meteoric rise of aquaculture or basically fish farming. Um, so in a sort of similar period, uh, actually you know, in, in 1964, the sort of catch, as it were, from um, farmed fish was one ton. Uh, by 2017, it was 2.3 million tons worldwide. Wild salmon is no longer commercially fished anywhere in the UK, so almost all salmon that you buy in, in shops is going to be farmed salmon, uh, normally from, from farms in Scotland. Uh, and in order to farm salmon, you vaguely have to try and replicate their migratory lifestyle, so they tend to start off in uh, freshwater tanks, and uh, as they grow, you migrate them into sea net pens. Um, so as I say, almost all farmed salmon in the UK comes from Scotland. So let's take a quick look at that industry. It has gone from about 50 farms or so, no, sorry, from, from two farms or so 50 years ago to around 221 farms now. 
Um, but as the number of farms has multiplied, the number of companies holding them has decreased, going from 132 uh, different companies at around, I think it's 1993, to uh, only 10 companies that now hold uh, almost all of the, if not all of the farms in Scotland. And these are some pretty powerful companies. Um, salmon is one of the UK's top food exports. I think it's number four in some rankings, although I've, I've seen it called the number one in others. Um, and the value of the industry to the UK economy uh, is, well, it's disputed somewhat, but there are some pretty big claims. The biggest I've seen, it values it as having a two billion a year total economic impact. So that sort of includes the knock-on effect of people paid by the industry going on to spend their salaries somewhere else. But there's basically a lot of money at stake and there are plans to double the output of the industry from the 2016 figures to the 2030 figures. So it's continuing this pretty drastic rise. And I think it's just important when you're looking at news reports that tend to value them in monetary terms or in tons for a fish that in fact only weighs a few kilos, it's quite easy to forget that at the center of this industry, there are, one kind's estimate is 35 million individual sentient beings. Now, I'm not here to give a talk on the science uh, behind, you know, fish being sentient, but one kind in 2018 helpfully put out a paper which does summarize some of the research in this area. And it, it does talk about salmon and, and their experiences of pain, uh, their reactions to it. The, the variations between personalities of individual fish, the fact that they have friends and foes, um, and the fact that many of the salmon on farms exhibit behavior patterns and serotonin levels that could essentially be described as them being in a depressive state. So there are a huge number of individuals um, here, and that could rise to 65 million potentially by, by 2030. Uh, I always think it's very difficult to picture numbers that big. So to try and give you an idea of scale, there are currently uh, six farmed salmon to every person in Scotland. Um, and those salmon, as the um, Scottish Salmon Producers Organization proudly announces on their website, live in a geographical area uh, half the size of Edinburgh Airport. So as you can probably imagine, whenever you get that many living things confined to that kind of space, you're going to have a few practical issues. Now, I don't want to spend too long on the environment because it's not what I'm here to talk about today, but it does touch on, on animal welfare in, in various different ways. So as well as problems about sort of water usage, about uh, plastic and, and diesel going into the waters, about um, you know, construction and constructing on seabeds and constructing in, in the sea, um, you have issues with biocontainment. So uh, essentially when they're kept in the, in the net pen feeds, um, their feces, uh, various chemicals that are used to treat them or feed them, um, and, uh, and the feed itself falls through the nets, and it basically wipes out the stuff uh, underneath. So the sort of gray blighted material that you can see in the background of this slide is called the bacterial mat. And it's just this sort of lifeless expanse of nothing that forms underneath the nets. There's also a risk of transferring uh, diseases or things like sea lice, which I'll come on to in a minute, to passing wild populations. And then there's also the um, welfare of marine mammals. So you may, uh, see stories about the salmon industry touching a lot on, on things like seals uh, and this probably is a good point to give you a quick news update. Um, this week there was some uh, a newly passed animals and wildlife bill in Scotland that's going to make certain amendments to the Marine Scotland Act and essentially ban uh, seal shooting. It's widely been reported as a victory by the animal um, protection pages that I follow. But I take the view that if there's a victory here, and it's hard not to say that there's some victory here, because when you look at seals, you can't help but be happy for every uh, sort of seal life that's saved. But if there is a victory, it's a bittersweet one at best. 
because the driving motivation for this new law was actually to increase regulatory alignment with the US so as to save a 180 million pound fish crate. So uh, yes, whilst there's every reason to applaud saving you know, 86 to 100 seals a year from being shot, um, this will impact millions of salmon going forward who may not be as cute as seals, but they are sentient and capable of, of pain and emotions. It also, the fact that you stop shooting seals, it doesn't remove the salmon from the sea, it doesn't remove the seal's appetite, and it doesn't therefore remove the need for deterrence. So what's going to happen is that they will move on to something else, and what's looked to be the most likely de um, device at the moment is a, a sonic device that's been described as sonic torture for other sea mammals like whales, dolphins, and porpoises that, that use sound to, to communicate and find their ways around. Um, moving on to the welfare of the salmon themselves. So just as seals get in, salmon get out. About 300,000 salmon escaped in 2017. You may think, well, good for them. But these are salmon that have lived their entire lives in captivity. They're not well suited to living in the wild. They've been fed um, their whole lives, never had to hunt, never had to survive. And so they don't tend to fare very well when they escape. You get really high mortality rates across these uh, salmon farms. Scottish Salmon Watch reported 23% more early mortality across all farms, with 34% mortality in the Western Isles and 27 in Shetland. Um, and Marine Scotland and Scotland Aquaculture reported a, a 10 million uh, premature deaths in 2016 alone. Um, Perhaps unsurprising, as we said, given the intensity and the number of salmon in a relatively small space, this is a breeding ground for disease, it's a breeding ground for, for parasites like sea lice, and it requires a lot of stressful handling of the salmon uh, that will inevitably affect their immune systems and, and their ability to cope with, with stress. Um, it's quite hard, I think, for me to really give a, a, a way of visualizing this, but there's another talk this evening with one kind by Corin Smith at Seven, also on salmon. Now, uh, Corin Smith has spent a lot of time actually in these, um, so filming salmon and filming what they experience. So if you really want to get a sense of what it's like, I'd recommend tuning back in at seven o'clock. Um, I will do my best with slides to illustrate it. So brace yourselves a little bit because the next few may make your skin crawl. I'm going to talk uh, about sea lice because that was at the centre of the case that, uh, that we were recently advising on. Um, sea lice are a particularly nasty parasite that propagate fast due to the high stocking densities um, at which these salmon are kept and the lack of movement and the fact that these salmon, unlike wild salmon, aren't able to migrate large distances and get into fresh water as they, they normally would. Um, these lice multiply, they essentially eat the salmon alive uh, and they expose their flesh and occasionally their skulls, creating what's known as a death crown. Um, the result is inevitably uh, high mortality uh, in farms where, where they have real sea lice problems. There are treatments for sea lice, uh, but some of them are almost as bad as the disease itself. Um, one popular way is the use of medicines and chemicals, but this raises its own issues. Um, there's a very fine line often between killing the uh, lice and killing the salmon. Uh, and as we've seen in land animal agriculture with things like antibiotic resistance, if you basically pump medicines or, or chemicals into a farm, evolution kicks in and what you're really doing is breeding superbugs. Um, the result is that chemicals have to be fairly tightly controlled now. Um, they're often limited to particular times of year uh, and you have to have veterinary supervision to use them. Uh, that's prompted a search for other kinds of treatments. Um, one is the use of cleaner fish and this looks far more holistic at first sight because you just introduce another fish population who swim around eating the lice. The problem is, is that um, wrasse and lump suckers, the main uh, fish species used to do this, they have their own welfare problems if you keep them in sea nets. It's not their natural uh, environment. 
they need different kinds of shelter. Uh, they need different kinds of food. They don't just eat these, these lice. Uh, they have different kinds of um, behaviors and personalities, and they don't necessarily all, uh, all naturally just live their life eating sea lice. So that results in, in high mortality rates for them as well, uh, which raises some pretty difficult questions about veterinary ethics. Um, there were 1.5 million of these farmer fish used in 2016, and that's tipped to rise to 10 million by 2020. Um, I'm not going to primarily focus on them today, but I think that there is a potentially very fruitful uh, ground there for, for not just ethical discussion, but also potentially uh, legal challenges in the future. What I'm going to focus on is the most commonly used mechanical treatment, which is called thermolysing. Thermolysing is basically a washing machine for fish. Um, it involves uh, high temperatures, rough handling, um, a series of pretty stressful steps. Basically, you have to crowd the salmon into a net. You pump them through a thin tube of water onto a boat. They're bounced along a metal grid, uh, blasted through seawater, which is heated to 30 to 34 degrees. Uh, and then finally, they are pushed back and pumped into a seawater cage. Um, when this goes wrong, it kills tens of thousands of salmon. And the result is that other salmon farming countries like Norway, which tend to have a considerably higher degree of regulation, are considering banning this treatment entirely. Um, obviously, no one just, no court's ever just going to take a lawyer's word for whether something is, is bad for an animal. Um, there's always a, a need to bring expert uh, opinion and expert advice with you when working on these kind of cases. So here's just an extract from what one of the experts says about it. Lynn Snedden was the first person to show that fish have um, nociceptors, which are a particular kind of nerve ending, and essentially concludes that the thermolyser it does expose salmon to painful temperatures. So uh, the brief was essentially, what's the law? What can we do about it? How can the law help? Um, it's pretty wide ranging, but particularly um, focused on this thermolyser and what could be done about that. So let's talk about the law, because that's what you came here to listen to me talk about. Um, at the sort of top level, you've got the you've got European law, which still applies till the end of the year. Um, animals under European law are sentient beings. Uh, EU members must pay full regard to their welfare requirements. You may, just on having heard what you've heard, take the view that this isn't necessarily compatible with the kind of treatments and conditions that I've just talked about. You may also take the view that this is a little bit vague um, to try and enforce directly. So if we narrow it down a bit and we look at the country level, uh, Scotland has an Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act. Uh, it's got a few differences, but broadly similar to legislation in the, in the other jurisdictions like England and Wales. Um, and it applies to fish farming. Interestingly, it doesn't apply to anything done in the normal course of fishing. So when you're angling or catching with a net, but it does explicitly apply to the um, sort of fish and the conditions on fish farms. Uh, section nine make, is 19 sorry, makes it a criminal offence to cause unnecessary suffering to a protected animal and section 24 places active duties on animal owners to protect them from unnecessary suffering. What does unnecessary suffering mean? Well, basically it's a balancing act between certain interests that the courts or the law consider to be legitimate. Uh, these are things like uh, people eating meat, um, and uh, suffering that might be caused if a particular, you know, avoidance of, of further suffering, so on and so forth. Um, there isn't tons of case law about what is necessary or unnecessary, and that's partly because most animal welfare cases end up going through the magistrate's court, which are the sort of bottom level of courts, and they don't necessarily have any precedential value when they decide on cases, so you don't cite them. Um, it, it sort of doesn't form new law or, or define the law in the way that it would if it was going through some of the senior courts. Um, nevertheless, there are a handful of cases and the uh, English, the cases in England are often the best indicator of what the Scottish courts would apply. So it's an English case, uh, Hall uh, and the RSPCA. Uh, 
Um, and in that case, it basically concerned pig farmers who failed to get treatment for their arthritic pigs. Uh, in order to determine whether or not this, the suffering caused was unnecessary, the court asked three questions. Firstly, do the pigs suffer? Um, secondly, was the suffering necessary? And this is a fairly high threshold because necessary means in the sense of it being inevitable. Um, and if it wasn't inevitable, uh, the question on which these things often turn is would a reasonably competent, reasonably humane, modern pig farmer in that case, be salmon farmer in this case, have tolerated such a state of suffering. Now, one of the difficulties here is that with pig farming, for instance, we have a statutory codes um, and regulations that quite clearly set out what um, the reasonably competent and, and humane farmer would tolerate or would do. Uh, and these are quite important, they don't necessarily create, or where they don't create offences in and of themselves, but breaches of the code are evidence that an offence may have been committed. Now there isn't uh, a code like that for salmon farming, which makes it considerably harder to work out what is or isn't unnecessary. But basically, uh, for now, uh, the law allows intensive farming. It's, the, the case law is absolutely clear on, on that, that generally intensive farming is allowed. So as long as there's intensive farming of the salmon, you could maybe argue that the lice are inevitable. Uh, therefore, some degree of treatment is going to be in fact required. Um, and, uh, and therefore, some would argue that the thermolyser is, is necessary. And that's largely supported by the fact that vets will often recommend it. Um, but arguably, this position changes if there are other more humane treatments available. And other than the chemical treatments and the, the, the lump suckers and RAS cleaner fish I've talked about earlier, there are a number of, of other treatments available, each with their own sort of varying effectiveness and, and varying problems. But there are certainly other things out there. Um, use of lasers. Uh, use of closed tanks or effectively closing off tanks by creating bubble curtains that deter lice from entering them, uh, using traps outside the tanks that lure away and kill lice. Um, if machinery does need to be used, uh, there's cold water machinery that sort of fires jets that dislodge the, the lice. There are also systems that keep the food or lighting or, or physical systems that try and keep the salmon lower down in the nets because the lice tend to um, propagate at the top level. And lastly, there's just strategically placing the nets in places where there's varying levels of, of salinity, temperatures, so on and so forth, that create more hostile uh, environments for lice, or using knowledge about these areas to work out where treatment needs to be prioritized. Um, So looking now at what laws and regulations there, there are currently around salmon farming, it's an absolute patchwork. Uh, there are little bits in various laws that impose duties um, and uh, these affect things ranging from uh, so environmental issues, reporting restrictions, um, uh, fish kind of management plans, parasite, there's some stuff on disease and parasite control as well. But what there isn't in the way, as I've, I've said that there would be with something like pig farming, is a statutory code of practice that pulls all the law together in a single place, fills all the gaps between it, sets basic standards about the things that aren't explicitly talked about in the law. Um, and the result is that when the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee looked into this, they described this regulatory framework as confusing, uh, poorly coordinated, and uh, called it light touch regulation. And it, it's not that there isn't a power here to, to issue a code in the way that you, know, you do with fish, you do with chickens. Um, the power is in section seven of the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007. It explicitly gives the Scottish ministers the power to make or adopt um, a code of practice that would regulate a lot of these various issues. The thing is they've just never exercised this power, so it just sits there unused. The result of this is that um, private players basically step in to, to fill the gap. Uh, you have the Scottish Salmon 
producers organization. It's an industry organization. And that's the only organization that set any kind of coherent code. But the, the code is voluntary. And it's set by people who you might consider to have a vested interest in, in um, well, lowering costs, making things easy, and, and who might have other immediate priorities than, say, welfare. Um, and if you want to get an idea of the difference between the impressions that you might get reading the code and the impressions that you might get going around salmon farms, um, the guidance in the code says that depending on the season, there should be an average of below 0 0.5 uh, or 1, depending on whether it's sort of the first six or second six of the year, adult female lice per fish. But the reality is that in the four years leading up to 2017, 48% of fish health inspectorate visits to seawater sites recorded sea lice problems. 20 farms had uh, averages higher than eight uh, adult females per fish in 2017 alone. Um, and the worst farm hit nearly 30, um, nearly 30 adult female sea lice per fish. And also this is just adult females. Uh, and that's because of, of it's taken a, from a disease control angle. They're the ones who lay eggs and so forth. But uh, if you look at the picture here on the right, uh, there's actually only one adult lice louse there. And uh, other louse, lice affect welfare too. So just measuring adult females isn't necessarily a good indicator of, of welfare. So let's come back to, to the thermolyser and, and this voluntary code and try and work out what the voluntary code, at least, says about thermolysing. Um, well, what it doesn't do in the way that you might hope is really clearly take a view on what kind of treatments and equipments are desirable or tolerated and, and so on. It doesn't spell out in any clear way of what these would look like. But I'd invite you to look at some of the provisions it does specify and read between the lines and take a view as to whether or not you think uh, putting fish through a washing machine is compatible. Um, equipment shouldn't create welfare problems. Uh, flows shouldn't be too strong. Pumps shouldn't injure or unnecessarily stress a fish. And rapid temperature changes should be avoided. And these shoulds aren't kind of permissive or prescriptive shoulds, they are mandatory shoulds for the purpose of the code. So if you want to be compliant, should is must. Um, so you may take the view that the thermolyser is incompatible with the code itself, particularly a code which I quote aims to ensure the highest standards of fish health and welfare. Of course, this is guidance. It's not law. But there is that power to adopt a code, and there is mention of the code in the law. Um, so if you look at the amendments made by the 2013 uh, Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act to the, 20, to the 2007 uh, Act, it actually explicitly references this code of good practice. Uh, you might think it references it in the place where you would sort of expect, given that they have a power to adopt a code, you might think that they would put an adopted or a standardised code. Um, so one of the questions that we faced was, well, does this mention of it give it any form of statutory basis? You know, is this akin in any sense to adopting a, uh, a code uh, using their, their previous power? Um, so what happens if you go to Marine Scotland and you try to hold the ministers to account for failing to enforce systematic breaches of this code? Well, you get perhaps a rather predictable response uh, that says, well, the code doesn't have a statutory basis. It's not legally binding. It places no obligations on the Scottish ministers and there's no legal basis for Scottish ministers to enforce it. So essentially confirming this is code of good practice, it's entirely voluntary, it's industry-led, voluntary, and there's no way to get it to, to be used. Um, the, 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 I mean, Parliament's using it as a substitute for any official uh, adopted or issued code, uh, but it doesn't have the statutory basis that such a code would have. So 
what options are left for someone or for a, a, a campaigning organization or a law firm trying to do anything about it scottish um, salmon watch came to us and basically said well what, you know what can the law do um so here are some very top line approaches that you can take to advise clients if, you, if you're working in animal welfare areas we uh, have a lot of experience at using a number of um, black letter law tools uh, one of the go-to for a lot of clients is freedom of information act requests this is brilliant for uh, bringing injustice to light for using resources effectively because they're relatively cheap it's an excellent campaigning tool excellent for informing strategies and getting information out there can really put pressure on people. The problem is it doesn't really directly force change. It's, it's not a way of getting cases into court. Um, then there's judicial review. Uh, judicial review is basically the big guns of public law. Uh, if you're a non-lawyer, you'll still probably recognize the mechanism from cases like the prorogation case, the Article 50, uh, the initial case, uh, the recent Heathrow expansion case, it's a very powerful way of challenging government decisions, acts, or omissions. So you could potentially try and challenge the government for um, systemic failures, for instance, for uh, refusals to, to, to issue or adopt a code. There are various potential routes that we were considering. The problem is, is that there's very, very little case law in the area. It's potentially unpredictable uh, and it can be rather expensive. And when you're working with a, a smaller organization, um, there are, you know, there's, an, uh, there, there's a, a balance to strike between how much you can risk for the kind of rewards that you're likely to see. Um, another tool that we're increasingly um, looking to experiment with, particularly in England, is private prosecutions. Uh, private prosecutions, basically what the RSPCA uses in England for all their welfare um, prosecutions. It's a great way to directly challenge acts of cruelty. It can ban people from keeping animals. It can... Um, it can really bring sort of injustice to light and it's a damning indictment on someone it shut down a farm or so on and so forth. The problem is it's not really a systemic challenge. You basically have to step in for the police. You have to do the investigation um, and it, it's not necessarily a way to challenge a whole system or a series of government decisions. There's the added barrier as well in Scotland that they're just not as easy to bring. Um, they don't have the same statute just enabling anyone to bring them you have to get permission uh, in a way that you don't in England. So what we started to consider were softer alternatives. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on what we're likely to do because I don't want to give away or we're still in the process of advising and, and picking options but I'll talk very generally about the kind of softer approaches that, that lawyers can take. Um, there's uh, interesting opportunities in Scotland at the moment. In February this year, Scotland appointed a new commission for animal welfare. Uh, the purpose of the commission is to provide scientific and ethical advice to the Scottish government. So working potentially with the committee or within the framework uh, to, to put evidence before, um, before people making policy, making legislation, and to try and improve standards that way in a non-litigious way, it is potentially uh, an increasingly uh, desirable and, and feasible route to take in, in Scotland. We don't have an equivalent yet in England. Um, another example of a, of a soft law approach is advertising standards. So there, there are advertising laws, there are trading standards, and there are official state regulators in, in the UK. But in fact, most low level advertising cases just go through the Advertising Standards Authority, which is a co-regulatory system between industry and the state. Um, and basically, if you think that a company or companies are making claims about animal welfare uh, and selling products, and you think that these claims are false or misleading, that can be a basis for a complaint to the Advertising Standards Authority. Uh, now, one of the advantages here, particularly for small clients or campaigning groups, is that so long as you, you make the complaint well, uh, you put your case at that stage, the Advertising Standards Authority will then more or less take it off your hands and they will do the, the legwork. Um, so it can be a cheaper or an easier alternative. There's an added advantage as well, being that um, it sort of reverses the burden of proof. You're not going to court here. Uh, 
uh, even though there's a, a sort of investigation process and a hearing, it's not a court hearing. And basically, if a company makes a claim, they have to keep enough evidence that that claim is true. Um, and they can be forced to produce that evidence to the Advertising Standards Authority. So uh, in 2013, there was an advert which claimed that none of that advertiser's cows suffered from mastitis. That was found to be misleading, not necessarily because the Advertising Standards Authority took a view as to whether it was actually true or not, but just because the, the advertiser couldn't provide the Advertising Standards Agency with enough evidence to substantiate the claim. Um, before I finish, it, it wouldn't be 2020 if I didn't give you a COVID-19 update. Um, in short, virus is bad news for salmon. Uh, in recognition of the stress that the, um, the pandemic has placed on industry players, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency has relaxed standards for things like reporting biomass and chemical use. Now, I was recently writing a blog piece for Advocates for Animals on lax biosecurity laws, regulations, animal law, and pandemics and disease outbreaks. Now, if you're familiar with the roots of COVID-19 uh, in a wet market in China with high intensity and poor welfare, you may share my concerns that now's maybe not the time to be relaxing biosecurity standards in an intensive wildlife farming industry. Uh, but I'll, I'll sort of leave that to you to take a view on. Um, the virus has also slashed exports. So uh, much of Scottish salmon is exported to places like uh, China, to, to the US. And these places aren't importing as much right now. The result of that is the salmon are basically left in cages or left to rot, as our client explains. Um, and they're in for what he describes as a cruel summer ahead. Um, I'm going to leave you with this thought. Uh, I hope that I've avoided being too technical or, or impenetrable on the law. I, I think that the law should be accessible and should be understandable to people who aren't lawyers. And I think it's important that people who aren't lawyers understand what it's doing or failing to do. Um, but I also think it's important, given that the news will continue to report these stories in terms of tonnage, in terms of dollar values or pound values. Um, and it's really easy to forget uh, that at the center of this industry, there are millions of sentient emotional beings that clearly feel pain.